Thank you, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, good evening. This is a meeting of the Citizens Advisory Committee for Capital Expenditures. On uh, today's agenda, we are going to go in over some categories of capital uh, related to streets, bridges, ADA, ADA as well as parks. Um, prior to that, I, I did want to uh, point out this, that this morning, every member of the committee should have received an email with some of the uh, presentations that we're going to be going over this evening. Not so, I mean, it, while it also would give you a preview of what we were going to be going over, but it was also just so that once you receive that, once you have viewed the presentation this evening, you have a place to go to reference it. And so uh, all of these are posted online on the website, so you can, you can go to it. There are also a number of questions about uh, procedures and, and capital process, the capital committee, the role of the, uh, of the Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, and, and criteria for evaluating projects. That was also included in the attachments under capital policy and procedures, which is also posted online. And then finally, um, attached to the email were uh, citizens advisory input forms. Basically, and this was a, an Excel spreadsheet as well as a it's in PDF format as well for individual members to submit comments and input uh, about projects they we, we discuss, anything we haven't discussed, comments overall. What I would envision is that um, as we go through these categories of projects, um, you will be, there's an awful, awful lot of information absorbed, you're taking notes along the way over the next few weeks, and that at the conclusion of that process, we will be asking all members to submit their uh, feedback. Uh, and this is a rather large group. We've got uh, 50 members now, and it could still get larger as we go along. And so I want to give everyone an opportunity to have input. And, and, and so what that does, it, it, it basically uh, asks, it covers each category that we're going to be going on over these next few weeks, and it, it provides some uh, opportunity to have uh, input. And it could be everything from hey, we don't think this project is important. We think this project is more important to have you considered this project or uh, we don't want to fund this project or any. And then in general uh, about the process of, of, uh, of, uh, for the capital committee to consider. Again, I'll reiterate the Citizens Advisory Committee's role is an advisory role to the capital committee. And then obviously the, the capital committee reviews what's before it, and it makes recommendations for appropriation to the elected officials. And it's, all, it's up to the elected officials uh, who have the ultimate decision about appropriations. Um, so I, I do want to reserve some time at the end of today, after the presentations, to go over uh, this a little bit more in detail so we can do that. Um, but I do want to get through the, the, the presentations first. Um, and, and just as a matter of process, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, we're going to hear from streets and, uh, and BPS on some of those uh, streets and bridge projects uh, so that everyone so that everyone everyone can uh, have questions. If you have questions as the material is being presented, uh, type that into the chat. And then once the presentation is over, we'll go to the chat and have those questions uh, addressed. Um, we'll, we'll do streets uh, and bridges and then we'll pause. We'll go to the chats and then we'll bring in parks to go over some of their projects. And then we'll again go to the chats and then we'll have, uh, hopefully uh, we'll go over some of the pro procedures and, and, and some of those other questions we have about overall process once we're done with the presentations. Okay. And, and by the way, if anyone has not received that email from earlier this morning, please let us know and we'll make sure that you get another copy or, uh, or if something's wrong with your email, just let us know. Okay, with that, I'm going to uh, give the floor to Rich Bradley, the president of BPS, and he has he is going to introduce some uh, some folks uh, in his shop who will discuss some presentations on some of that material that was distributed this morning. Uh, and it, it, it's very inf it, you'll find this very informative in terms of the conditions of some of our streets and bridges, and I think you you'll be. Uh, You'll have some questions after. So, Rich, I'll give this to you. Thank you, Paul. Good evening, everyone. So, what I'd like to do now is we'll start with the street presentation. 
as we talked about last week, we are going to highlight the projects that we have in the critical category so that you can get a thorough understanding of what they are and why we believe they are critical projects. Our first presenter tonight will be John Kohler. John is our um, planning manager. He's a professional engineer and he works at the Board of Public Service. When John completes his presentation, we will go to Jamie Wilson, who is the street director, and he will present on the street paving, LED lights, and an additional project he has. And then I will turn it over to uh, Yark Chernikevich, who's my chief design engineer in BPS, and he will go over the ADA transition plan and bridges. So John, will you please make the first presentation? Sure, thank you, Rich, and good evening, everybody. I've got five critical needs projects to present this evening. You pull up my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, John. Yeah. Okay, great. So our first project on the critical needs is a Tucker cycle track that we submitted for federal funding under the Transportation Alternative Program. We did receive in 2021 $1.4 million in total project costs. The federal portion is $1.1 million. And the local match that's required, that's identified in the critical needs is 300,000, which is 20% of the 1.4 million approximately. Uh, this project should start design in the end of this year and into next year, and it's slated for construction in 2023. It provides a two-way separated cycle track along Tucker, starting at Shoto on the south, up to Washington Avenue on the north. And it involves uh, physically protected through a barrier uh, where we will be constructing a feature, a raised median and delineators in certain areas along the route. But it's also protected by parking on the southbound Tucker. So the cycle track will be located along the city hall side, the west side of Tucker. And it also involves Metro bus upgrades through the construction of bus stop uh, floating islands that we work closely with by state to incorporate a design that's uh, functions with their operations for bus floating. And we also looked at a uh, vehicular lane reduction. Currently there's four lanes of southbound traffic. We are proposing three lanes of southbound with the uh, parking and then the protected cycle track. Also part of the project involves a mid-block crosswalk upgrades and safety improvements right outside City Hall where we're incorporating bump outs, in a raised median in the center of the road to make that uh, unsignalized crosswalk safer. And this has been in the planning stage for several years. It's been part of the downtown St. Louis multimodal plan. It was recently adopted in November of 2018. It's a tier one highest level protected low stress facility for bicyclists. It's in trail nets connected St. Louis plan. It complies with all the elements of our complete streets ordinance. It's also part of the gateway bike plan. But importantly, it bridges a, the Mill Creek Rail Yard. We have few bicycle connections that, that cross at Mill Creek Rail Yard. It connects directly to the bike lanes that MoDOT put in on Shoto, 
It connects to the just not protected bike lane that we built a few years ago, and also the future brick line greenway, which will most likely be on market. We have significant support for the project. Greater St. Louis Inc. has endorsed the project, Alderman Jack Coder of the 7th, and Great Rivers Greenway District supports the project. Moving into the next project, this is Cass Avenue. It's broken into two parts. This project is important for the city because it's part of the promise that the city made for the relocation of the NGA site to North St. Louis. We've broken it into two phases. It's two miles long with a total cost of about $31 million. It connects NGA to downtown through multiple neighborhoods along the corridor, all the way from I-70 on the east to Grand on the west. Proves safety and provides uh, multimodal facilities along the corridor. We've got new lighting, streetscape amenities, and 5G small cell deployment along the route. The first phase, this is on the east, Tucker to Elliott, which is just west of Jefferson. It's one and a quarter miles. That's the biggest phase, 19 million. What you see in the critical needs table is the request for local match, which is 20% of the 19 million or $3.8 million. So this improvement would benefit several neighborhoods, including Columbus Square, Carr Square, St. Louis Place. It services a residential multifamily neighborhoods and also provides a lot of opportunities for commercial and office development. One of the features that I want to point out in this first stretch is the median that you see on the graphic. It's a 25-foot space reserved for future transit, either light rail or bus rapid transit. This is part of the preferred route that was uh, identified in the north side, south side uh, expansion project. It also provides a multi-use path on the north side and then a bicycle or, or sidewalk on the south side with two one-way 12-foot drive lanes on each side of the median. The second phase to the west of Elliott and to the west of Jefferson, this directly benefits the Jeff Vanderloo neighborhood, several multifamily residential, local businesses, Vashon High School and Harrison Community College are all within this corridor. We have a slightly different streetscape plan where since the light rail's not in this area, we choked that median down to 12 feet. We're proposing two drive lanes, one in each direction, but with parking on each side. We also have this 12 foot multi-use trail that will connect to the planned Brickline Greenway on Grand and that north side Brickline routing. There's a lot of vacant land available for future geospatial industries in this area and other neighborhood type development. My next project involves Hall Street drainage and roadway improvements. This is a MoDOT Route H. It's on the north side of the city, begins at Adelaide and runs about 4.1 miles up to Riverview. The city in partnership with MoDOT MSD, SLDC, and other city departments that have been working on this for three plus years. And as a design has developed, we've determined that the project will cost more than what was originally anticipated for MSD and MoDOT. MSD has promised to commit 8.8 .8 million. MoDOT has 5 million for the roadway element. And the shortfall is about six and a half million 
which is a priority for the city for several reasons. One is if you've ever driven this corridor during any type of rainfall, there's significant flooding and significant ponding that creates a hazard for anyone using the roadway. We've got a problem with uh, high speeds and crash history on this segment. This is a significant freight corridor, an industrial area that's part of the North Riverfront Commerce Plan. And for these reasons, we like to pursue the local match portion of the six and a half million shortfall, and that's 1.3 million. And then finally, we have a congestion mitigation air quality project that working closely with streets to identify the highest priority corridor that doesn't yet have signal interconnection. We like to submit a project from Devolver along Delmar from Devolver on the west to Vandeventer on the east. There's eight signals between those two endpoints, and all of those signals would be reconstructed with new controllers, new detection, and fiber optic to connect them. And the whole idea of this project is to improve air quality, reduce emissions by providing a corridor that is retimed so that you don't have so many frequent stops and uh, pollutants from vehicles waiting at signals that aren't interconnected or detected when a vehicle approaches. As part of a CMAC project, we also will make all the intersections compliant for curb ramps and hits, crosswalks, uh, push buttons for pedestrian crossings. And that project's approximately 4 million with 20% is the local match, 800,000 is what I've listed in the critical needs list. And those are the top five projects I've identified. And at that, I'm gonna turn it over back to Rich. Thank you. Thanks, John, for your presentation. So next I would like to introduce uh, Jamie Wilson. Uh, Jamie is uh, a professional engineer and he is the director of streets for the city of St. Louis. And Jamie will present on three projects that would affect the street department. Jamie. Jamie, are you muted? Can you, can you hear me now, Rich? Yes, we can, go ahead. I unmute it and then it must have muted me after time there. So sorry about that. So again, hello. Um, the first project I'd like to talk about uh, from the street department is paving. Um, in looking at this and prioritizing our needs, uh, we've chosen our principal arterials and those arterials, um, that's the street that represents the highest level of street we have in the city that carries the most volume, that provides um, by definition access to direct access to the highway system and all the feeders from the local streets. Um, north south uh, is primarily where we look as a lot of our east west arterials, uh, as many may not know, are maintained by MoDOT and those include Natural Bridge, Manchester slash Shoto, Page, uh, Graveloy, Chippewa, uh, just for example. So. Uh, they've covered the, uh, the surface on those east-west principal arterials uh, as such, so we looked at the north-south. Um, we are proposing the Causland Skinker, basically from Arsenal to Page, Union from Enright to West Florissant, Kings Highway from Gravelly to West Florissant, Jefferson from Chippewa to Shoto, Grand from Holly Hills to Hall Street, South Broadway from Dover to Shoto, and North Broadway from Cole to the Northern City Limits. Uh, and if I didn't say earlier, that does represent 40 miles of principal arterials in the city. Um, these are streets that are in dire need of resurfacing. Uh, we don't have a, a paving budget. Uh, we're, we're budgeted to, to patch these, so it's been a while since these have been paved. 
Um, so they're obviously in serious need of it, and we're, we're requesting uh, $14 million to resurface these uh, major arterials in the city. Uh, the next project I'd like to propose from the street department is regarding our street lights. Uh, the city has approximately 46,000 of the Cobra street lights, the most common street lights that you'll see. There are some decorative street lights, but I'm talking about um, the about 30 foot tall Cobra lights. Um, we have 46,000 of them. The last several years, we've been upgrading them to be more energy efficient and current LED technology. Uh, we do that through our normal maintenance. So for example, when a light goes out, we won't go back and replace it with older technology. We'll replace it with our LED fixture off the shelf. Um, and that's just as they occur, as the outages occur. We're also able to replace them through uh, cooperation with local aldermen. Uh, they use their ward improvement funds to expedite that process. So instead of waiting uh, for those outages, uh, sometimes they give us money to, you know, go through and, and do a street each year uh, to kind of expedite that process of, of getting those into the reward. Uh, and we have utilized, lastly, uh, a couple uh, Missouri engine, uh, energy loans uh, to also expedite that process. Our interest in this current technology is the older technology becomes more expensive to, to purchase is also that these LED uh, fixtures are obviously more energy efficient. Um, we get about $24 per light per year in savings. Um, in all, we're approximately 65% complete uh, replacing streetlights in the city. Uh, we are proposing to purchase and install 17,000 streetlights and help us finish that process off. So we're asking for about 4.2 million to do so. But I would also point out that the purchase of those lights will also result in over $400,000 per year in our electric bill savings. Uh, so it's, it's obviously a, a purchase that's, that's worthwhile considering. Finally, I have a project um, in dealing and thinking about the streetlights, um, delving into that. One of the things, and it came up after the fact, and I apologize for this, for not thinking of this earlier, but uh, it's a very critical need for us, um, is our downtown lighting vaults. Uh, we have a lot of, we have 11 underground vaults in the downtown area uh, that contain our streetlight uh, substations. That's how they're all fed. Uh, this is really old equipment in old locations. They're probably 60 or 70 years old. Um, obviously, the equipment's well past its physical life, uh, service life, and it's literally physically falling apart. Um, as well as the drainage structures that support it, that, you know, as it rains, it obviously has to be open so it doesn't um, overheat. So in being open, it does let water in, and the drainage that's in there, obviously 70 years old, it starts breaking down and either getting clogged or caving in. Uh, a lot of these underground vaults routinely flood, uh, creating a, an obvious water and electric mix that we don't, that we don't prefer. Uh, it leads to both the physical condition and the flooding that we see on a routine basis when it rains leads to a very, very unstable uh, lighting system downtown. Uh, and that is not, that's a, it's an obvious uh, safety concern that we have uh, for the public. So we are proposing $2 million to uh, rebuild those vaults, rebuild the drainage, install new current equipment. Uh, to last us a, a good amount of time and to be able to provide a, a stable lighting uh, system for our street lights downtown. Uh, and again, we're requesting $2 million to accomplish this, and that would include the design uh, and installation uh, of those uh, lighting vaults. Um, that does conclude the three projects that I would propose from the street department, and I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to Rich. Thank you, Jamie, for your presentation. Next, I would like to introduce to you Yark Chernikevich. Yark is a professional engineer and he is the chief design engineer for the Board of Public Service. Tonight, Yark will present for you on the ADA transition, ADA upgrades, and the bridge project. So, Yark. Thank you, Rich. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen before we, we get to the details. 
Can everyone see my screen here? Not yet. What about now? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, among many responsibilities of design of the design division are management of professional services contracts with consulting engineers and uh, architects, and also management of federally mandated bridge inspection program. So I will talk to you today about the uh, capital need, capital uh, expenditure needs for the for the following categories. Improvements to the to city facilities that are needed to accommodate people with uh, disabilities and bridge improvements that are needed to maintain functionality of the city transportation network. Uh, I just wanted to apologize. My presentation has a couple more slides uh, added uh, compared to what was published. So I'll make sure that this will be updated uh, after we are complete here. So let's start with ADA transition plan. Um, what is ADA transition plan? Um, ADA stands for American Disabilities Act of 1990, which is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination based on disability. ADA transition plan is a formal document uh, outlining uh, cities compliance with Title II of the Act that requires municipalities to, to have a a plan to make accommodations for, for everyone. A transition plan is, is, is essentially a roadmap that inventories and prioritizes accessibility improvements to existing infrastructure. Uh, while the city has been uh, actively improving accessibility for all residents for the past uh, over 40 years uh, through permitting, through enforcement of permitting uh, requirements and, uh, and design standards, this transition plan combines the past efforts and, and help uh, guide improvements moving, moving forward. Uh, so the benefits are, you, know, you, you, will see, you will see complete view of the city facilities, the, the describes conditions of city assets and identifies barriers and recommends solutions for their elimination. Uh, complying with the requirements of transition plan uh, can be very challenging for, for city leaders, for community leaders. And, but the prospect of losing out on federal, federal funding for other projects is a good motivator for officials to, to complete these plans. That is why in 2018, as part of general obligation bond, uh, for, bond for capital improvements, the one, one and a half million dollars was allocated for the phase one of the ADA self-evaluation and transition. Completion of the phase one is scheduled for fall of this year. And um, the accomplishments of the phase one will include partial self-evaluation of cities programs, activities and services. Uh, also partial review of city facilities for accessibility, including sidewalks, um, curb ramps, uh, pedestrian signals, uh, city buildings, uh, some other properties and parks. And also uh, that phase one uh, will have uh, will develop conceptual costs to improve pedestrian uh, for improvements of pedestrian network. Um, continuation of this project into subsequent phases depends on funding availability. Examples: some of the examples of phase two include further continuation of the ADA com compliance surveys improvements that are needed to provide accessible parking and pathways to city hall, pathways to elementary, elementary school, senior centers, polling places and other public service locations, um, removing barriers to access in city parks, uh, such as fairgrounds park, France park, Marquette park, that would include pathways, uh, restrooms uh, and other facilities. And also, um, uh, eliminating barriers in commercial corridors that will include interacting with by state to make the, the city's routes to their services accessible. So why, why is this project important? 
So it is an essential part of cities integrated approach to removing barriers. Uh, approximately 50,000 people living in the city of St. Louis have disabilities, such as difficulty seeing, hearing, walking, learning, managing emotions and other human conditions. Uh, it is also a right thing to do. And also Title II of Americans or Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act requires that. And that's why we, we, we determined the recommended funding for request for this project continuation is, is $2 million. That's all I have on ADA transition plan. Let's move on to, um, to, to bridges. Um, so let's look at the bridge improvements. So uh, the city of St. Louis owns 74 bridges. Um, most of the roadway bridges are located within the city limits. Most of them are primarily owned by MoDOT uh, and, and the city of St. Louis. It's currently, there are 74 located on, on city streets. And this map illustrates their locations. Most of our bridges are located along central uh, corridor crossing rail, route, rail yards along Mill Creek Valley. Uh, or River de Pearl, uh, over Metrolink routes, and then the, the Soto Spur, and, and then there's a few more, few more uh, up north uh, over terminal railroad lines, and of course we have a few bridges at the at the airport. Um, just for comparison, this this shows the bridges that are uh, owned by Moda that gives you a sense of scale. They must be all along uh, interstate. Many bridge structures, which we, which we own, support high volume traffic routes with average daily traffic that ranges from, from, from 30,000 to 50,000 vehicles per day. When we say average daily traffic, that means uh, there is a total traffic count per year that's divided, divided over 365. That means some days this traffic could be much higher or, or, or lower. Uh, so here you can see the list of these bridges with the highest, with the highest traffic count. Um, here's an overview of bridge structures that cross in Mill Creek Valley railroad yards, which carry the highest volume of traffic each day. Uh, in fact, uh, combined, uh, combined average traffic for this exceeds well over 200,000. So each of these bridges makes it possible to, to to, to ship raw materials, finish goods to factories, uh, facilitates travel, so consumers can purchase goods and services. When one of them closes, economic activity, economic activity slows. And I, I'm sure you can imagine what happens when, we, when one of these bridges needs to be closed. Um, this chart illustrates age of the city bridges. So what you can see here, um, they were constructed according to our records, the oldest 1874, all the way to, to this, this runs through 2019. So the good news is we have um, about four, well, 44 bridges that were constructed in the last 40 years. That seems like a, a, a good pace. The bad news is we still have over 16 bridges that are over 80 years old and, uh, and another 14 that, that are aging rapidly. Um, and they, they do require significant repairs. Anticipated service life for bridges that are well-maintained can exceed 75 years easily. Bridges that are not well-maintained will last much, much shorter. Um, maintaining safe bridges, bridge, safe bridges is a critical public safety issue. There is the, therefore the federal government requires all bridges in the United States to be inspected every two years. Our bridge inspectors, uh, when, they, when they inspect bridges, they rate each component of a bridge on a scale from zero to nine, uh, just the way you can you see on the right side. These ratings are coded on the structure inventory and appraisal sheet, which is the federal form. And that, that form contains total of 116 data items. And this is defined by the National Bridge Inspection Standard. Um, overall bridge rating, good, fair, or poor, is directly related to condition of its components. 
So a bridge is considered in good condition if the deck, superstructure, and substructure are rated at least seven, eight, or nine. In any of these bridges, bridge elements is rated five or six, the bridge condition is considered fair. If it falls four and below, it's considered poor. And that is a basis for this chart, which shows condition of the city bridges as of July, 2021. Out of the total of 74, um, we have 30 bridges in good condition, 28 that are considered fair, and 16 that are poor. For comparison, if you take all bridges located in the city, in the city of St. Louis, that includes MODAT, you, have, you can see the numbers below. So, 238 are total bridges in the city, 87 are good, 121 are fair, 37 are poor. And so for comparable statistics is for Missouri and US. Why is it important? The next chart will show you. When you look, when you look at the aggregate, this chart on the left side shows you, illustrates percentage of bridges in poor condition that are owned by the city. The, the next group shows the bridges that are in the city of St. Louis, but owned by Moda. There's only 9% of them are considered in poor condition. Comparable, comparably, the, all Missouri bridges are, there's only 8% in poor condition and across the US also 8%. So you can tell from this chart that the percentage wise, city owned bridges, we, we, we there's twice as many poor bridges in poor condition comparing to the, to the other entities that are listed. So this is a really a, histor a direct of historical underinvestment uh, in the city on infrastructure. And unless adequate funding is allocated, this gap, which you can see here, will continue to grow, making our infrastructure less safe and more vulnerable. Um, so let's move on to more specific examples. And these are, the, these are the three bridge replacements we, we are requesting um, to be included in the, in the capital expenditures. These three bridges, the, the, total of, the total amount is of local funding that is needed is 7,600,000. And the next few slides will show you examples of conditions of bridges that are recommended for replacement. Let's start with Compton Avenue of Mule Creek. This is the total replacement cost for this bridge is 20 million with the local funding as mentioned earlier, 4 million. This is the condition of the bridge. You can tell the superstructure is, is, is badly corroded. There is no, th those are representative conditions which our inspector identify during, during the bridge inspections. Another picture from the same bridge, condition of bearings that carry main girders, really, really poor conditions, also joints. Here's another photo. And it shows corroded girder ends and cracked abutments. Um, next example are two bridges uh, on Linder Boulevard. And uh, not many of, uh, not many know that those are actually two bridges. One is over Metroing, one over Forest Park Parkway. They were constructed at different times. They all, these bridges are also in very poor condition. This is. Lindell over Forest Park Parkway, the example of um, railing in the bad conditions, and of course, very extensive corrosion that, that is present overall. And that's another example that's Lindell Boulevard over Metro. In each of these repl replacement costs for each of these bridges is 9 million, and that's why we're asking for 1.8 million in local funding. Um, Next, uh, I want to show you critical a list of critical repairs, not replacement. Those are repairs for for local for, for various bridges. This is a whole list here. It totals to nearly two point eight millions, and it basically this is a list of critical repairs that are needed in addition to the replacements I mentioned. Uh, so let's take a look at the couple examples. So this is Kings Highway over Mill Creek. That's the damage we have to address, the cost of these repairs is 1,150,000. There's another example, there are joints that are really bad, they're really dangerous for drivers. Again, that's part of the, uh, the 
over a budget that was allocated, over an estimate that was 1,150,000. Hampton Avenue over Mill Creek and, and other bridge that needs that needs repairs, so the crack columns and look like also not in good condition. And here's another example of a joint on Hampton Avenue. So in addition to, uh, to critical funding needs uh, that were identified here, and uh, there are also other repair and replacement needs, which are listed on the next slide. This is, those are other needs um, that are, we don't consider them critical, but they, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in our territory, when we look at them, they are, they are still arching. These, these repairs, these bridges are not getting any better. But I wanted just to give you a perspective of what we are dealing with. And there's just these first seven, they are really needed for replacement. And then you have a number of repairs that are, that are needed on the lower half of the table. Um, just an example, this Lafayette Bridge, on, this is one of them. Those are the conditions that, again, we didn't consider critical, but urgent. Um, and last uh, slide I would like to share with you, this is Columbia Avenue Bridge over UP that was closed in 2018. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. Uh, this structure exhibited extensive deterioration. It was routinely overloaded by heavy truck ignoring posted signs, you can see this 15 tons and one of our inspectors took a picture of two trucks passing each other, passing on, on this bridge. And that bridge was actually constructed in 1910 and served over hundred years. Due to shortage of funding, it will be constructed no earlier, the replacement bridge than in 2024. So I would like to just summarize it, and this is obvious, uh, basically why investment in our bridges is critical. And these are the three, three elements that, that the economies consider that why bridges propel economic activity. They are critical component of our infrastructures, wages earned by bridge construction, maintenance workers have positive impact on local businesses, and they also facilitate cash flow when they join the they join areas that complement each other economically. In summary, uh, here is, here is uh, what we are asking for. Uh, condition, I wanted just to say the conditions of the city bridges are rather typical for many cities with uh, aging infrastructure. We do have a very effective bridge management system in place that, that includes dedicated and qualified bridge inspection staff, dedicated planning and programming staff that seeks funding opportunities. We have excellent consultants and contractors and also supportive management and, and city administration. Our major challenge is adequate funding to keep up with the rate of deterioration. So um, as, I, as I indicated earlier, this condition, condition of our bridges is considerably falling behind when compared with the rest of the state of the US. So that's why we are right now recommending to allocate minimum 10,395,000 for critical repairs. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll turn back to Richard. Mark, thank you for the presentation. And I'll turn it back to Paul. I think you wanted to take some time to do some questions and answers. Yeah, I, um, yeah, and thank you guys. I, I thought this was a very informative presentation. I, I do see the, the chats piling up here. So let's go to the questions and I can get back to the beginning. First question on the, uh, I think that was the cycle track question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the match of 300, uh, of 300,000, I believe. And in, in the, in our, in our, in our a, uh, inventory, it mentions 280. Is that what's? Is there a difference there? Is there an estimate? What, what's the difference? Right. So as we talked about, we are developing this list as we go. So we're doing some subtle changes as we go. The 300,000 is the correct uh, amount for the local match share that we're looking for. And so that will be noted in the final reflection of this report. Okay. Secondly, will GRG 
be providing funding for the project at all since it connects to the Brookline Greenway. And is, and is there? And so I'm, I'm assuming that that question is on the uh, Cass Avenue project. I believe I saw that pop up. John, would you like to comment on that? Was that in reference to Tucker or Cass? I believe it's Cass. Go ahead and comment on both, John. Okay, on, on Tucker, we did request GRG to participate in the funding. And at the time of the request, they uh, provided support through letters in the application for federal funding, but they did not contribute financially to that project. Uh, on CAS, uh, we have not yet approached GRG for any funding support at this time. Hey, hey John, just so, so I'm clear, and we discussed this yesterday, but on this, the cycle track, that federal fund has already been awarded. Is that, that's why it's on the critical list, is that? That's correct. We have a shortfall of the local match that's required to support the federal portion. Okay. All right. Under Hall Street, has the project design been reviewed for possible climate change impacts? So, are, are, so one of these projects, do we do uh, things that would, which make traffic more efficient and, and that improve its function in terms of climate? Uh, Rich, you want me to address this one? Yes. So this particular project has several flooding and drainage improvements. It will provide a new storm sewer system and drainage system to handle up to 20 year rainfall events where currently very little rainfall will cause problems with operation of the roadway. And I, I saw another question in the chat about lane configurations. Uh, we are working with MoDOT to reduce the number of lanes. We've done some traffic studies already to see where we could do a lane reduction from four lanes to possibly one in each direction with the center turn lane. But uh, the project would be designed uh, to handle uh, the appropriate stormwater event as determined by Metropolitan St. Louis Sewer District. Yeah, this next question is somewhat related. It, it says, is it wise to invest that much money in a, a flood prone area? It sounds like what you're trying to do is address the flood prone, uh, the flood, uh, uh, prone condition. Yeah, the flooding is a significant component of the priority because it's nearly impassable during small rain events. It makes the road dysfunctional for users and uh, in MSD's criteria and even MoDOT's in the cities, we recognize this as a significant freight corridor that we want to keep functional and design it in a way that serves the industries that exist and potential industries that will come into that corridor in the North Riverfront. Okay, um, this question is, how does a nonprofit elder person endorsement impact their selection at Critical? I, I, I think this is related to the bike track on Tucker. And, and the reason why that's critical again is because we've already been awarded the funds. Is that again, correct? Correct. Right now we are searching for local matches to support that federal amount that's already been awarded to us. Okay. And would it be possible to work with Bi-State to mass upgrade bus stops across the city? That's my letter. Yeah. That is a, a worthy project to, we have uh, an estimate from Bi-State to accomplish that. Uh, and that's something for consideration. Is it critical? That would be up for debate. Is it needed? Yes. So that, that is a, a project that's a strong potential. I think you may have addressed this. If I didn't, if I, I missed it, it's talking about the a road diet to address safety concerns on Hall Street. This is the traffic. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, traffic management. 
Okay, curious as to why the Del Mar Boulevard project in particular is considered critical? That is a great question. I'm glad, glad that was raised. So every year, the city has opportunities to submit projects that are related to air quality improvement. Because we are a region with poor air quality, the federal government gives the city of St. Louis region funding to support these congestion mitigation, air quality, or CMAC projects. So because we are strapped oftentimes with local match, we are looking for projects to submit under this limited funding category. And historically, we pursue signal interconnection. Now, fortunately, uh, most of the city is already interconnected and tied back into our traffic management center, but there are segments along collectors and arterials that have not yet been interconnected. This is a priority corridor that has not been touched for CMAC. So if we can get local match secured come February of 22, we can then apply for a federal CMAC grant to support this project. And that's why it's critical because there's no other CMAC uh, where we have local match identified. Uh, and this is a high priority for the city. Uh, major arterials are getting paved. Will they be striped in the same way they are now? Or are there other plans being considered for some of them? Amy? Yeah, Rich, thank you. Uh, as we pave all these, as we do now, um, it's a perfect opportunity before you stripe it to take a second look at things, um, to see how volumes have changed, traffic patterns have changed, um, and see if there's opportunities to utilize that pavement in another fashion um, before we do it. Uh, I'm sure everyone's witnessed what happens when uh, you grind out the old striping and restripe, or if you black out uh, some of the old striping and restripe, what that looks like at night or during the rain. Um, it's not ideal by any stretch. So we really try to reserve any striping changes or pavement marking changes um, to do when we repave. Uh, as it pr presents the most optimal conditions for drivers. Um, so recently over the past several years, we've started looking at these uh, in a committee type fashion where um, it's not just the street department determining uh, the lanes. We, we are the, the labor force that does that. Um, but we have uh, routinely, we consult with members of BPS, uh, TrailNet, um, City of St. Louis Planning uh, and Design Agency, uh, just to get a full representation of, of different disciplines as we look at some of these, these streets. Uh, even on the, I, if you recall during my presentation when we uh, mentioned MoDOT routes in the city, even when MoDOT uh, repaves their routes, uh, like recently, Chippewa, if any of you are familiar with, they went uh, basically city limits all the way to the west, all the way east um, to where Chippewa comes into Broadway and Jefferson. Um, we reviewed uh, their paving plans and looked at what striping they were um, proposing, which was what it was before. Uh, but we went through and, and looked at it with a different uh, lens uh, as far as considering um, with lower traffic volumes, do we have opportunities for uh, bike lanes? Can we improve parking in some areas and things of that nature? So um, it is ingrained in our process now, and it will stay ingrained in our process as we look at these arterials. Uh, these are long stretches of arterials. Um, so there can be, as, as the definition of them is, that they, they pick up volumes as they get towards the interstates. Um, so it's not likely, for example, road diet would occur uh, as you come in to connect with I-64 or I-44. Um, but as you reach the northern and southern limits of each of those respective north-south arterials, uh, there are legitimate uh, opportunities to take a second look at uh, utilizing that pavement width, uh, which is very, very wide in some of these cases uh, for alternative uses. Uh, and that is what will be done um, if we... Uh, are given this 14 million uh, to resurface these, these arterials as presented. Uh, 
So it's absolutely on the and absolutely something we'll look at. Okay, there's a, a, some, a, a subsequent question on the uh, Kings Highway project. Uh, that are, that uh, portion, there's portions of Kings Highway currently going uh, undergoing uh, potential traffic calming. Uh, so would the repaving decision be delayed until the current study and planning is complete? We would coordinate that with both. There's a there's one, I believe, War 28 study occurring. Uh, towards the Forest Park area, just north of there, north of Lindell. Uh, then there's also South Kings Highway 1 um, in the Gravoy to uh, Chippewa area. Uh, we will coordinate that with this effort so um, we don't go in and grind out new striping and, and put in new stuff. So we will we will make sure that's all coordinated for sure. Okay. I, and I think this question may have come up last week about the Hampton improvements that have already begun. Um, will it include the intersection improvements at Jameis? So, uh, Jamie, you know, we talked about this this past week and the conversation was that the arterial paving projects that um, are listed in here, the Hampton project actually that's listed in here is a federal grant project, which would replace handicap ramps, signals, um, and do total upgrades, could be possible traffic calming, lane diets. The paving project that's going on there right now is simply a maintenance project, a mill and a pave, correct? It was, it was funded uh, by two aldermen um, to, uh, from Chippewa to Gravoy. Uh, they did uh, fund a traffic study uh, several years ago to take a second look at what we could do to improve traffic safety on that stretch. Uh, the result of that study and through the public engagement uh, resulted in um, the recommendation for a lane reduction or lane diet there to go to a three lane cross section, uh, basically south of Lansdowne on Hampton, not to get too specific in this, but uh, if any of you are familiar with the Hampton Village area, the lanes will stay the same in that area because that's obviously a very busy area as it intersects with Chippewa. To the south of there, um, they will drop a lane. It will become a three-lane cross-section, one lane each direction, and a center-left turn lane uh, down to just north of Gravoy, where um, as you approach the Gravoy intersection, uh, it will return to the normal lanes uh, that support that traffic signal there. So that would constitute a road diet, uh, and that was that was uh, recommended in in terms of uh, improving traffic safety in that area. All right, um, lighting vaults. The project's not the budget draft. Yeah, that was something that you uh, had added after that draft was submitted. So uh, that's why they're not in there. And as we go along, and we hear from departments, we're getting certain either revisions or additions and we'll keep up that updated and we need to do that uh, for that particular that just came up yesterday uh, that particular project uh, i saw some comments last uh, week about the street lights and why it was important if you think big picture is it's a safety improvement uh, some of that electricity comes from the lavity plant which is one of the highest polluting coal fire plants in the country reducing electricity can use uh, potentially lower emissions. So that's a, a plus for our LED uh, conversion. Uh, what about pathways to high schools? This is an ADA question, I believe. So the answer to that would be is obviously everything within the city right away, our city buildings or city facilities are included in our transition plan. We would certainly work with uh, our partners uh, with uh, city school district or private for that matter uh, to make those improvements. All right. Uh, are the railroads being encouraged to upgrade their bridges over St. Louis Street? So the answer to that is, is we work with the railroads continuously. As everyone on here is aware, they cross uh, city streets at grade crossings in numerous places in the city. There are quite a few um, trestles that cross over city right away. We are constantly uh, working with the railroad to perform maintenance and keep those things safe. They also are required by federal highway, excuse me, federal railroad administration to inspect all their bridges on a regular cycle, just like ours. 
The reason their bridges last a lot longer than ours do, one of the reasons is, is because of they don't use the de-icing agents like we do on the roadway, which eats up the structures relatively quickly. So um, we are constantly working with them. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no plans at this time to replace any railroad bridges, but we continually encourage them to keep them painted, keep them up, keep them maintained. Okay, uh, thanks, Rich. Hey, uh, uh, looking at the time, what I was gonna do is, I I'm thinking that there's a lot of questions here I'd like to get through, but we had parks here as well. So I, I, what I'm thinking is that maybe we, we should reschedule parks for next week and just try to get through these questions so that we've got this material covered. Because I'd also like to have some time at the end to cover, just go over process questions as well. So if that's okay, what I think I will do is just continue to go on with these questions and uh, we'll schedule parks uh, for next week. Okay, so let's, let's uh, keep going. Do all the road and bridges proposals increase access for pedestrians and safety? So I will start that and then I can turn it over to Yarek. So all the bridges that we are replacing were built in, in previous day standards at a previous time. All the requirements today for bridges require upgraded crash barriers. They require widened sidewalks. Um, they also require that we are also required to look at complete streets when we do them. We look at things such as um, bicycle paths, uh, bus turnouts, anything along those lines on major routes to um, accommodate our complete streets ordinance. So Yark, any further comments on that? No, I just wanted to add that all these, all current standards that are required by um, FHWA, MODAT, PROAC are being incorporated. Pedestrian safety is, is one of the key criteria, key design criteria that is uh, applied during the design process. Uh, that's, that's all I would like, I would add. Are the 16 city-owned bridges that are rated poor also the ones that are the oldest? Generally, yes, that is, that is pretty consistent. I mean, without looking at this, the table, I, I don't remember if all of them, but generally those are the oldest bridges we have. Okay. Will any effort be made to include public art or sculpture or murals in bridge reconstruction projects? So the, the comment that I would have on that is the city of St. Louis does have an art ordinance um, the art ordinance does not apply to federally funded type projects. And as we um, have talked about, all these bridge replacement projects, complete replacements are federally funded. And so we look at things that we can do on those projects that the federal government will fund. Uh, I can point your attention to the Jefferson Avenue viaduct, which has a de decorative median. I can point your attention to the Grand Avenue Viaduct, which has a decorative median and some decorative towers. There are things that we will do um, that we work through public engagement with the neighborhoods. We take their suggestions and we, we go back to MoDOT and our federal partners and see what we can do that they will allow us to do so that we're not simply putting up a sterile bridge. Other very simple things that we do to um, make bridges stand out are a simple hand railing that is more than just a crash barrier type rating. We've done some modest decorative lighting. We've done things like tint the sidewalks a different color, um, things that bring out the structure but are not cost prohibitive to build and also not cost prohibitive to maintain. Okay. Will the Lindell and Union bridges include reorientation of the intersection? So my, well, answer, okay, that would be, my answer to that would be is, and the ARC, I can let you talk about that. We need to study that and have a substantial amount of public engagement before we will even know exactly what the configuration is. There are a number of options that are being talked about today 
everything from something similar to what's there today to roundabouts to other things. And we are just not at that point yet. But Yark, you want to comment? Well, we initially our initial application was for further grant um, addressed that need as a replacement of the intersection as it is. However, with the interest and the signals we are receiving from stakeholders, there will be a study done in a, as a conceptual phase of the project to address uh, the issues that are raised by stakeholders. As Rich said, this is, there's so many um, issues that are resolved. This is entrance to the forest park. And we would like to improve the traffic flow there. And a lot of those requirements are, are, are rather conflicting. That's the reason why we made a decision to uh, request consultant for the project to study the possible, possible alternative solutions and present them to the stakeholders. Will all these projects be prevailing wage jobs? Absolutely. The city of St. Louis by law requires that everyone that works on our jobs are paid Missouri State prevailing wage. Okay, so this is a question again, talking about the Tucker cycle track. So it's being recommended the Tucker cycle track would be completed before the bridge is replaced. That is not, that's not true. They're in two categories. One is in the street category and one is in the bridge category. And I think John would agree with me here. In fact, I know he will. That when we submit these grants to our MPO, which is East West Gateway, for consideration, bridges always are more highly considered due to safety than streets. Okay, will equity be factored into the criteria? Uh, Taylor, that's a, that's a question I think we're going to talk about uh, that's more general in terms of the process, and we can, we can talk about that uh, once we're done with streets. I challenge uh, the, that the act, uh, adequate, uh, okay, this is again about criteria, adequate and uh, the challenge of criteria there are adequate, uh, hope to address that issue. Okay, in reference to Tucker, some bridges needing critical repairs are relatively new and damaged, shown as expansion joints, both repairs and, and, and bridge and re, uh, repairs and the bridge replaces. Are there materials which can be used that are more resistant to salt and other corrosion? Well, I would say we use the most up-to-grade uh, materials that we can when we have uh, consultants design them. But obviously, we also use materials that we can maintain. Yark, I'm going to let you make a comment following that. Well, we often re need to respond to... <laughs> to sales pitches that offer us the latest and greatest products that have, have not been tested. So I am always reluctant to accept some of these propositions. We generally work with MODAT specifications, which are uh, well-tested, approved, uh, and, and verified in many locations. Expansion joints are very uh, critical portions of the, of the bridge. They typically were much faster than the remainder, the other components of, the, of, of each bridge. And on the design side, we encourage to eliminate expansion joints as much as possible. And that is done often on shorter bridges with a longer spans. That's not always possible. So there are other, other ways we, we try to eliminate the problem. Of course, with the um, current de-icing techniques that are being applied, uh, there's really not much we can do. Generally, we would like the expansion joints to last at least 10 years. You know, this is really the, the absolute minimum. Some of them last longer, some of them unfortunately last shorter. So um, I'm not sure if I answer your question, but we are very sensitive to selection and specifications of the product products we are, we are allowing to be installed. And the other thing I would say on that that's really important to understand is, is by doing bridge maintenance, and keeping up with the problems here, it prolongs the life, extends the life of these bridges. As Yark presented his presentation, we have bridges that are 60, 70, 80, 100 years old on the system today. And so the useful life of a bridge is about 50 years, but we're doubling that. And a lot of that is all due to the consistent maintenance uh, that we, we do and the care that we put into these things. 
Will any improvement require tearing down of businesses or homes? Can you read it one more time, Paul? Yeah, will any of these proposed improvements require tearing down of businesses or homes? Not that I'm aware of, John York. I think we have some projects that require the acquisition of the right of way and the removal of the improvement, but I can't think of any specifics at this point. I believe uh, Southwest Columbia Bridge will require acquisition of the right of way and removal of the one of the buildings there are basically in a, in a way. But that's the only the only project I can think of. I agree with that, York. The Southwest Columbia Bridge is the only one that will require uh, some demo, minimal. Can we go item by item over which items have already grant funds lined up? Um, let, let me, let's, uh, in order to facilitate this going, uh, tell you what, could you just identify which ones just uh, here that you know of where grant funds have been awarded already. And what we'll do is when we update the inventory, um, we can go down each one and specifically say, but yeah. the general question is how many of these projects have we already got federal funds for? So John, you wanna answer that one? Sure, I'll start with my projects. The only one that is funded federally of the five that I identified is the Tucker Cycle Track. The CAS, uh, the Hall, we have funding partners on Hall Street, MST and MoDOT, but no federal funds yet. And then no federal funds yet on the Delmar CMAC project. And I'll turn it to Yorick to identify the Bridges that already partially funded with design, or some of them have design and right of way and construction already funded. Yard? Correct. So, Compton Avenue uh, over Mill Creek, uh, that uh, the design is already funded for this bridge and is being underway. Uh, uh, Linda Union over Forest Park Parkway and Linda Union over MetroLink has already, has also funded, the design has been funded already, these two projects. Okay, I, I, if you oh. guys, yeah, let me, let me let's just break in. If you guys could just send us details of each one, uh, which ones have actually been received, uh, what portion, and if it's a pending application, whatever, any, anything you've got that would just give us a little bit more insight, because I think that's a very good question about where we are with the federal funding on those projects, that would be helpful. Yes, we will. Okay, this is a Hall Street flooding, uh, flooding along Hall Street, and not great functional if there are truck shipments to the lanes, uh, interior lanes. Uh, well, it, a functional issue with their truck shipment. Their trucks can still utilize the interior lanes of Hall during a flood event. However, long-term, a fully functional Hall Street with a connection to I-270 will be needed for freight. Is that? Yes. So that would be, uh, is that one of the, is that in the project or is that something that you're saying that it's gonna be down the line or what? So Hall Street is the major transportation route with most of the transportation companies along it in North City. Uh, the major connections are at East Grand and Adelaide. Currently today, Hall Street does run into Riverview Boulevard, Boulevard, and you can access 270 in the west, western direction, but the project is limited to the Hall Street corridor, so nothing beyond uh, Riverview, nothing beyond Adelaide. And uh, to add to that, MoDOT has recently rehabbed Riverview from Hall Street to 270, repaved, built some medians, improved the whole movement for any users. Okay, on the Cass Avenue project, what is the status of the Northside Regeneration TIF 
district authorized by Board of Alderman in 2009. Are there any funds in the TIF district that would be applied to this work? In 2009, Northside Regeneration promised that its special taxing district would fund similar improvements on Cass and Jefferson. Hmm. Well, I'm not aware of any TIF funds being utilized for that project, John. I am not aware. At this point, that has not been discussed with BPS. Okay, the last CAC meeting, it seemed like a lot of members were not excited about using capital funds for the NGA street improvements. Will the CAC be able to learn more about the proposed needed street project as we can make an informed recommendation for street capital improvements? This relates to the uh, anything related to NGA, uh, Rich. So, John, you want to answer sure. that one? I don't have any knowledge on it, but. So the city passed a bond issue or SLDC to for infrastructure improvements to support the NGA development. A lot of those funds have been earmarked for the Jefferson Corridor all the way from I-64 up to Natural Bridge. That whole project is funded and is in various stages of design and right-of-way and construction soon to begin. We also, through those bonds, uh, provided match funding for the I-64 at Jefferson City Streets, which is the whole street network around uh, just north of 64 around the new MLS stadium. It was a network designed to accommodate a functioning roadway system with the removal of all those old ramps that exist from the uh, I-64 spaghetti of MoDOT infrastructure. So we rebuilt that grid uh, with support to the NGA bond funding. Uh, my understanding, uh, we, all, we also had the commitment to reconstruct CAS and uh, there's a shortfall of funding at this point or hasn't yet been identified as a uh, how to fund the 32 million uh, needed for chaos at this point. Okay, uh, 14 million for North South major quarter is a great use of funds, I believe, and wonder if sidewalks on these corridors can be addressed. Signage replaced, litter bins replaced trees, added going beyond just repaving to really improve the look and functionality of our most used roadways, the front doors of our neighborhoods. Basically, it's looking, are we just talking about paving or, or can we do uh, making the look of these uh, arterials improved as well? So, um, Jamie, do you want to comment on that? Our assumption uh, for the paving was just the paving itself. I think the ADA was a separate component of that. And by ADA, I mean the sidewalk system as part of our ADA transition. Um, that's how we had uh, prepared this estimate. Okay, so what you're saying, it doesn't include anything, because uh, there was a question about the appearance in, 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 in enhancing the, the, like the trees and, and sidewalks and things like that. Uh, your estimates are, are strictly for the arterial paving itself. Correct, Not, nothing involving uh, the aesthetics of this. St. Louis designated by the EPA as a non-attainment area for the 2015 ozone standard. That's a comment. Without understanding the pots of dollars involved. Okay, I, I find it very difficult to evaluate any of this without the understanding of the pots of dollars involved. When we talk about the portion of the cost of any project that will come out of the city budget, or are we talking about current regular budget or ARPA funds? I can I can address that a little bit. Um, we are talking a. a couple of sources, well, a number of sources. As Streets has, has described, there are federal funds available for uh, up to 80% of a project, in which we are struggle, always struggle to come up with our 20%. But in overall capital funds, uh, within the capital budget, we have a number of sources, the largest was a wood, which is uh, half cent sales tax. 
But in terms of ARPA, there are funds within our revenue uh, within the revenue replacement component of ARPA. And I can I can talk with that about that a, a little bit after we get uh, through with streets and BPS uh, about uh, what the guidelines are for allocating those funds. And then in addition to that, one of the other sources is what uh, we will have is uh, any any surplus monies that we have out of the end of this fiscal year going forward, uh, we can allocate towards capital as well, which uh, unlike ARPA, ARPA is going to be restricted because you can't use ARPA funds to match other federal funds, but that uh, the city's funds would not have that same restriction. And we can talk about that a, a little bit more as we go forward. Um, but there are a number of sources we can identify in terms of how we do it. Uh, the idea is that you want to leverage uh, what you have so that you can maximize, for instance, federal uh, four to one matches. Uh, that's why that is one of, one of the criteria that's highlighted in, in the policy and procedures. We can talk about that when we get to that point a little bit more. Is the recommendation from the street department to have the full $14 million contributed to arterial street paving? It was listed as needed and not critical on the inventory spreadsheet as provided to us. That is a critical need. It moved over. It, again, we are working through the draft of this as we go. And that is one of those um, notes that we have made for a critical project rather than needed. Okay, here's another question, ARPA. If we wanted, if we wanted to use ARPA funds for a big investment in youth space in North St. Louis Rec Centers, parks, well, we could talk to parks. That'd be something that would go through this committee. Um, if it was, if it was for infrastructure related, it could, and that would be something that you could uh, suggest. And, and obviously, we're, we can talk about the input forms and and recommendations to the capital committee that you'd like to make. Um, service type stuff that, that would not come before capital. Again, as long as it's capital related, infrastructure and equipment, that type of thing, that's what we'd be going over. And so that, yeah, if you'd like to make that suggestion, yes, that would be a suggestion you can make. I don't think it is the capital committee's belief or desire to concern ourselves with those questions. Okay, well, that's, a, that's just a comment on the previous question. I do appreciate the expertise uh, on the display here for the folks, uh, kudos to you guys. I think we should be better served sort of providing them a framework and valuation. We will be talking about that. Okay, talking about process, streetlights. So, if a citizen or someone wanted to, to determine where within BPS has historically spent money on capital improvements, is there a map or other resource available to find that information? Yes, we have, we have information on the capital needs that we've spent on railways and bridges, and we could provide that. I'm sorry, can I just follow up on that? Because that was a question that was asked uh, last week as well. Where is that information publicly available and, and how is it presented? So it, it is presented in a tabular fashion I don't believe it is on our website, but we can certainly present it to you. That's not a problem. And by tabular, I think you mean an Excel spreadsheet? Yes. We may also have some maps to show that, but I'm definitely sure we have Excel spreadsheets. Uh, to confirm, we've worked with East West Gateway Council of Governments to develop maps that show all the federally funded transportation projects that uh, for the past 30 plus years, that we have a comprehensive plan view of the location. And then uh, adjacent to that is a tabular format of what each project was and the dollars associated with each project, which we can include as part of the information to the committee. question about sharing emails with all the members of this uh, citizen advisory committee. I, 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 you are free to do that on your own. I would not want to uh, just uh, jeopardize the privacy of anyone on that committee. And um, 
Um, so I, I, I would not feel comfortable sharing everyone's contact information. We don't put bike lanes on. Please don't put bike lanes on grates, please. Apparently, Shoto and Grand Bridge bike lanes, okay? To clarify on the question about Tucker cycle track and bridge, I thought that Tucker was not included in the bridge repair list for this round of recommendations on the critical needs. Uh, are we being asked to approve what is listed as critical and needed, not just critical? Well, Tucker is not included as a bridge project. Tucker is included as a street project, cycle track. And there is a Tucker project that is needed under bridge projects, but it is not considered critical at this time. And again, we'll update the uh, inventory with as these departments present and all to reflect whatever the latest uh, clarification is. Uh, and again, as uh, committee members review that and they, they have thoughts on what's more critical or what's more needed than something else, that's that's uh, feel free to comment on that. Some comments, I'm looking for questions. Let's see, I think okay. I think that is the end end of the end of the chat. So a lot of some of were comments rather than questions. Okay. Um, well, thank you guys very much. I think this was an informative discussion about our streets, bridges, ADA needs, and we will have to schedule parks. Uh, for some other time. Uh, but thanks, Rich, to your guys. Uh, next, I, I do want to get into uh, questions that we had uh, for tonight about uh, some of the uh, questions on process and policy and such. In your email this evening, uh, there, were, uh, there was an attach, or this morning, there was the attachment, as I mentioned, uh, on policies and procedures as they currently exist. Uh, let me pull those up. On your screen, you're gonna see that the, the, when the capital, basically the, the list of policies and procedures, uh, it, it has the two committees, uh, both the capital committee uh, established by ordinance it's, this dates uh, originally uh, with the funding dates, uh, the original capital plans, it's in 89, but there were subsequent ordinances and we had the half cent sales tax approved in 93. Now the citizens advisory committee uh, as established by ordinance is charged with the responsibility to review and assess capital needs and to advise the capital committee on the development and recommendation of the CIPs and corresponding capital budgets and to review the city's accomplishments with respect to the capital budgets approved in previous years. The committee shall consist of two appointees by each member of the Board of Aldermen and four appointees by each member of the Board of Estimate and Apportionment. So that's where that from. Um, capital planning policies, I'm going to read through all of that. But I, I did want to jump down to uh, criteria evaluation. And you can see we discussed this a little bit at the last week's meeting, but in case you need reference, uh, capital committee shall apply the following criteria to evaluate the merit of individual projects. Uh, capital improvements, which will foster St. Louis's goal of preserving and improving, improving municipal buildings and other assets will receive priority. Capital improvements, which will foster St. Louis's goal of fiscal stability and soundness will receive priority. Capital improvements, which will foster St. Louis's goal of preserving its infrastructure and heritage will receive priority. Projects which reduce the cost of operations or energy consumption will receive priority. And projects which promote operational safety will receive priority. A couple, uh, several other criteria were approved subsequent to those original criteria. Uh, basically, it's, it's saying uh, no match amounts for bridges uh, it was a priority. So in other words, you're, you're trying to maximize that four to one match that we talked about, as well as uh, any under, under uh, current mandates uh, from the federal government uh, and any ongoing necessary replacements for operations. And so that's the criteria as it currently exists. I, I know um, some of you have had questions about the equity criteria and how do we incorporate that? I think that's a, uh, 
that's something that we can we can begin to do as well. I did want to share with you just for your information um, another map because any any additional criteria you you want really want to have good data. And, and I appreciate Nate's question about past uh, uh, past projects because that's where it begins getting data together. And so in order to make an assessment of where we are uh, with projects. So let me pull up another item. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna enlarge this a bit, but what this is doing, this, this is a draft of a map that's basically putting all the projects as they are exist or are estimated or proposed on a map to show where in the city they're located and what the value of them is. Now I, I see it, again, this is a work in process and, and, uh, progress and it's gonna take a lot of work to do. But I think when we start talking about issues of equity um, and, and, and how, the, how funds are distributed throughout the city, I, I can't be the judge of that, but what I can do is work on getting those uh, the information uh, out there. And so what, you, what you'd what you like to see and is something that we want to do is identify the projects, where they're located and put some dollar amounts on them. And so that's what this is doing. Now I already see some, some issues with that. Like for instance, with the pools and the rec centers, you got pools, $7 million. Well, that that's that's a collective amount for each. That's not each pool, That's that was collectively. So you're going to have some uh, uh, a lot of work that needs to be done to refine that. But I, I thank PDA for uh, pull, pulling together some of this information, but basically what it's doing is starting to map out where some of these items are. Uh, bridges, critical need and desire, where they are located, critical need and desirable is, and then play where the rec, rec centers are. And I, I think this is the nexus of the, what uh, I believe some discussions would uh, entail in terms of where we are, with evaluating where the city uh, locates its capital improvements and which city, which areas of the city need more, uh, and where the and and uh, where the existing facilities are located. So, with that, let me let me uh, go to the, this chat and, and just see um, if you have any questions. Are there any questions about this any further? I, I again, I, I'm going to tell you this is going to take a lot of effort, and, and I think it's something that. Uh, is a good thing to do when we start evaluating uh, over the longer term. I, I, I did. I had some discussions over the over the weekend with some email, on the emails, and I, I did want to point out that I think these are not mutually exclusive efforts. Uh, um, we've got we are so far behind on some of our capital improvements, and I think that bridge that bridge uh, presentation will tell you that. That's something that we have to do. I mean, there are some things in there that we've got to get done and we've got to take this opportunity. But I think with a second, uh, a second uh, installment of the ARPA funds coming next year, we also have a potential for uh, the, the federal infrastructure funds coming next year or maybe later this year. Hopefully we'll get something from that. I, I think we're going to have a number of uh, uh, bites at the apple in order to get there. And so hopefully we can get a little bit more uh, information on that. But I, I, I think this is a good start and, and will get us hopefully uh, in that direction, um, answer some of those questions and, and so we can uh, push this forward. And with that, I'll also, I, I did wanna uh, point out again, the other attachment I, I had, um, which was the, the um, citizen input form, uh, and I'll share that as well. I'm, I'm just bringing this up. I sent this to every member of the committee, both in an, an Excel spreadsheet as well as a PDF form. What I'm looking for here, and this just gives you a form for any of the categories that we present for you to put comments on if you think something is not important or it needs to be important and is overlooked for each category. It also has a, a, 
a section to discuss other projects to consider that we may not have considered. We've, by the way, we've received a couple of those already. I know BPS and streets, and usually if you send them uh, to me or my office, I'll we'll forward them to BPS or streets to review, and hopefully we can get some feedback as this uh, uh, effort continues. And then uh, other comments about the process, and, and so we can do that. What I'd like to be able to do at the end when we're done in in uh, and in the next, uh, after this next four or five weeks is that everyone submit one of these forms so we can consolidate all this or at least uh, uh, organize this so that we've got a, a consent, a, a, an idea of what, what you all are thinking. And so we can present that to the capital committee. And I'd expect to be able to post those, on, uh, post those results online as well. So we will be keeping all these documents updated on, on, on the website. I, again, um, as we get information out, uh, I'll, I want, really want to get the uh, agendas and detailed information out to you in advance uh, um, as much as we can. We didn't get the, the presentations uh, on bridges and streets until last night. So that was a, that was a little bit uh, sharp, but I thought it was important to see to, and to share. Okay, uh, going to the chats. The question is, is the concern is the evaluation criteria in the CFP doesn't include equity indicators. Are we going to address that? Um, I, believe, I, I believe we can address that, but it's gonna take time to address that. And, I, and, I, and, and in any evaluation, you're gonna need data. And that's what, we're, we're, that's what that map and that whole uh, formulation of trying to uh, assess each of those projects, where they're gonna be located going forward. But I don't think that's necessarily exclusionary of proceeding with at least some portion of funds that we can so that we can allocate later uh, that we can get going on on this um, uh, on this project on this process. You, you think about some of the bridge repair projects and some of the, for instance, the PSAP, which is the 911 center that we're going to be talking about later. I think uh, those are going to be some projects that you'd probably want to get out the door quickly, uh, but we can address that. And I think we will, uh, uh, and hopefully we can, but I can, uh, I guess being a budget guy, I always say it really begins with data and, and getting that and mapping it out is important. And I think that will help. Okay, um, let's see here. Anything else? Okay, I, I think that's it for this evening. And we're running a little bit late. I'm sorry to keep you. I know I, I promised I would keep you all about an hour and a half, but. Um, Thank you, uh, thank you guys, to Rich's guys uh, for presenting and thank you members of the committee. Uh, as we get more information, we'll be updating and we'll be sending out uh, agenda uh, for next week. Uh, we should be focusing on uh, some of the public safety components of, uh, of the, of the uh, inventory needs list. Um, I, I, I'm told parks, we're gonna have to reschedule parks. It probably won't be next week, but at some time before uh, over the next several weeks. So uh, that's all I have for tonight. Uh, thank you all very much. I just wanted to ask one question since we are talking about oh, sure. connecting over email. I just wanted to ask the sure. committee uh, and just wanted to clarify a couple of things. We are a public committee, which means that enough of us get together to have a quorum. We are required to have a public meeting. Am I right about that? I would have to, I'm going to have to check with the city council. That sounds correct, okay. uh, but I'll have to see what that is when it, regarding citizens advisory type, type if, meetings. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so I just want to make sure that if we do something, we're, we're complying. Yeah, no, that, that's actually, it's, that's a very good point. That's a very good okay. point. And we'll check on that to make sure. So if, so if you guys get together and you want to discuss things uh, among yourselves, uh, um, yeah, I, of course, it's a 50 member group, so uh, it's going to be, you know, it, it would be hard to constitute a quorum less than that. So, uh, but, but I'll, I'll check on that to make sure. Okay. Very good question. Thank you.
Yeah, and the point is that hopefully we can discuss some things that we don't have to do this while you all are sitting here and we can bring our questions to you uh, in a more organized fashion. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all.